Hi everyone, I'm <laughs> Chloe. Welcome back to the Mentors Connect podcast. Today on the podcast, we have Kobe Hanok, who is the CEO of the ASX listed company, Weave It Nano. And today is going to be a really interesting and relevant conversation. Weave It Nano is a company within the semiconductor industry and they're spe- specializing in developing really interesting RAM technology, memory technology, which I have absolutely no idea technically about. So I'm going to be really excited to be able to learn from the expert himself, Kobe, today. So thank you, Kobe, again so much for coming on. Oh, thanks, Chloe. Hi. (laughs) So as I mentioned before, obviously, you know, you have an amazing career now leading a team who are really leading the way in this exciting technology. But I want to get started and hear about your background and how you have now come to the CEO position? Well, I guess uh, started off as uh, an engineer, got my engineering degree and worked uh, in, the, in the beginning just, you know, developing uh, computers. I mean, I got into semiconductors very early, uh, back already in the early 80s and uh, was working as an engineer for many years. Um, kind of quickly jumping forward, uh, uh, in 95, together with four friends, we decided to start my first startup. Um, and, uh, that's where the team basically kind of convinced me to start moving to the business side of things. So I became VP sales there, uh, set up a, a worldwide sales channel for that company, uh, it was a great 10 years uh, there. We, we were already selling more than 100 million uh, US dollars. Wow. And, um, and we sold the company off. Uh, so that was the, my first exit. Um, after that, I went through different roles of uh, CEO. Well, I, I was CEO of, uh, of another startup. I helped them take off. And I set up my own consulting business. So for about 10 years, I was basically helping startups set up their worldwide uh, sales organization, uh, uh, positioning and and all of that. Uh, Part of that, I guess one of the more famous uh, things that I did was I was working with a company called Jasper that um, Mm -hmm. uh, after three years, we doubled their sales and and got them sold off. uh, so I guess another exit that I was involved in. And um, more recently, uh, I guess it's already five years ago, uh, uh, WeBit's board initially approached me to join as a board member. And then the previous CEO, uh, for personal C- reasons, had to um, step down. So he recommended that they hire me. And uh, here I am. Wow, that's so amazing. And I think it's also, you know, really cool that you started as an engineer and that now, obviously, that technical would have come through as on now as along with your sales. So um, before we get started into the main bulk of this episode, I just wanted for you to tell us a bit about Webit Nano and what they do. So Webit is, as you said, in the semiconductor space. Uh, semiconductors today are really everywhere. You know, people, and I realize that in Australia, there isn't a strong semiconductor industry, so people are less aware of it. But I mean, semiconductors are basically, you know, a, a, an average new car already has almost a thousand semiconductor components in it. Uh, your washing machine, your refrigerator, your practically anything you look at has semiconductors in it. So it's, um, and, and practically any semiconductor component needs a memory, right? You want to be able to uh, remember things. You want to be able to keep the code somewhere, the, the data and so on. And one of the key things is being able to keep it so that even when the power is cut off, you don't lose everything. So mm-hmm. if you think of your USB stick or you know, your laptop that you turn off the power and it still retains the data, uh, that's called a non-volatile memory. And that's what we're developing. The, the existing technology today is called Flash. It's been around for a long time, yeah. doing a great job. But like anything in semiconductors, uh, uh, it's running out of steam. It has limitations, and we're developing now a new technology called resistive RAM or RERAM, which is much faster, requires, uh, consumes a lot of less power, uh, ha- is much easier, simpler, cheaper to manufacture. So uh, a lot of advantages. No, definitely a lot of advantages, and that sounds so cool. Oh, that'd be so exciting working, you know, within the team, leading such a cool way. So. 
Now I'm going to start, you kind of touched on it a bit, you know, semiconductors and their relevance and prevalence within our daily lives, but why are they just so important for our future? Well, um, you know, the world has become really dependent on computers and semiconductors. You know, it's uh, when I talk to investors, uh, you know, I think the thing that is easiest for me to explain, you know, just 10 years ago, if you would look at the top 10 market cap companies in the world, they were, uh, you know, energy companies, finance companies, whatever, you know, you had really one that was uh, semiconductor related. Uh, today, nine out of 10 of the top uh, market cap companies in the world are basically semiconductor companies or, or extremely heavily dependent on semiconductors. So, uh, I mean, today social networks are, are something basic that everyone uses all the time. You know, your cell phone is, you can't move without it, right? And, wow. and your laptop and everything. But, you know, we have sensors all over the place, everywhere, right? And, and all of these sensors are basically based on semiconductors. So, uh, I mean, you know, when, when there's semiconductor shortage, you can't have cars. And I think that's something that everyone can relate to today. It's, it's well-known cars and, and many other um, uh, appliances are not available mm. because you don't have semiconductors. <laughs> yeah, I remember the big, you know, all over the news, semiconductor shortage, everyone is going crazy. So yeah. You're absolutely right. Really, really essential. So thank you for that. So now I wanted to talk about, you know, how does memory chips link into all of this? I know really basic questions, but trying to get an idea. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's good. I mean, you know, there's memory is prevalent and it's really, it comes in two forms. You know, there are memory chips that are 100% memory and, you know, they're used to store huge amounts of data. I mean, you know, you think of all of the surveillance cameras that pop up everywhere. You need to keep that data somewhere. Uh, think of all of the Instagram and, and YouTube uh, and, and whatever. Uh, I mean, all of these videos, all of the video clips that people send on WhatsApp and, and whatever, that's a lot of data. We're generating unbelievable amounts of data every day you know it's it's like every year the the amount of new data that we're generating is uh you know it's it's almost like what we had from the beginning of time until last year it's it's orders of magnitude larger than what it was just a few years ago so we're talking about lots of data you need to store it somewhere and you want to store it in a place where it's easily accessible where you can retrieve it quickly. And, and that's why, you know, the RAM technology, random access uh, memory technology is so important. And then in addition to that, you have uh, today, because everything in semiconductors has been shrinking so rapidly, you can put full systems on a single chip. Wow. So you can actually put a processor and communication and sensors and all kinds of stuff on a single chip. And again, you know, no system can work without memory. So you always have to have memory in there. And, and the demand for memory, both the standalone memories and also the embedded inside system on the chip is, is just going crazy. No, that's so cool. And now I want to link that to the RAM technology which you're developing and how that's different to the traditional technology for memory, like flash. So RERAM, the whole approach, I won't go into the technicalities, but in general, memories traditionally were focused on storing data using a charge. You know, you either mm. had charge or you didn't have charge. RERAM is resistive RAM. It's actually on, based on a completely different type of technology because we're basically building and breaking a resistor. Oh. So I won't go into the details, but it's very different. Um, the thing about rear amp technology is that it's what's called a back end of line technology. It comes at the end of the manufacturing process, whereas flash is a front end of line technology. And it's basically manufactured as a, in the first steps of, of production. This has a big impact on, on many things. And, and it really, you know, the rear end technology doesn't impact the design so much. It, it just comes on top, very easy to add it. So, you know, when you manufacture a rear end, you're basically adding maybe 5% to the cost of a chip. 
that you're manufacturing. With the flash technology, uh, it's much more uh, complex to manufacture the flash. And, and you know, normally you'd have uh, maybe 15, 20% added cost to the chip. So it, it has That's a financial big difference. Impact. Big difference. And, yeah, and it also, yes, yeah, definitely. And, and it's also, RERAM is just, as I said before, it's significantly faster, it's significantly lower power consumption, so greener, you know, now everyone's looking for, uh, you know, a smaller footprint on the environment. Um, and uh, it works uh, in, under more extreme uh, um, environment uh, situations, you know, the retention is better, the endurance is better. So yeah, it, it has quite a few advantages over the flash. No, it definitely sounds like a lot of advantages to me. And I definitely, you know, I've been reading a fair bit and watching interviews also you've done with other people and it definitely sounds like the future to me. So great work. And now before we start finishing up, I just wanted to hear from you what you think the role young people will play in the future in the semiconductor industry. Oh, I think that young people have a, you know, a very important part here. First of all, young people are born today with a telephone in their hand. Yeah. They're born into this digital age. Uh, I mean, here in Israel, I, I see you know, the little kids are already thinking about their first uh -huh. startup and, and it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, the young people have the energy, they have the, you know, this innovative spirit um, they, they can think about the needs of the future. They understand, you know, what is happening. Uh, you know, they live, uh, if, if talking about semiconductors or about in general, all of the software applications and, and all of that. So I think, uh, I mean, the world is really going in this direction. Uh, uh, young people here in Israel, uh, I just, you know, on, on a practically daily basis, I have young people come up to me and tell me about a new startup that they want to start and, and ideas that they have. And, you know, they, they ask me for some advice and it's, it's amazing. I mean, I love, I love all of these initiatives and uh, uh, it's, it's clearly uh, going to be very exciting in the next uh, few and not just few years. Uh, I mean, the world is really going under a real transformation and it's led by the young kids. Yeah, no, so everyone watching you young kids, you know, lead the way. So now before oh, yeah. we finish up, I wanted, obviously, <clears throat> just to get a piece of advice from you to perhaps a young person who is aspiring to be a leader in technology, in the future of technology like yourself. Well, I would say, first of all, don't limit yourself but what, by what you think the limits are, you know, just think, uh, you know, be imaginative, be creative, and, and don't say something is impossible. Because that's the key thing. You know, nothing is impossible. If you really want to do it, you know, it's possible. Just find a way to make it happen. And I think that's a key thing uh, for, for young people, you know, not to put the constraints on them that sometimes the older generation might try to define that these things are just not possible. Um, and, and, don't give up, you know, the, there are so many obstacles in, in practically every startup that I was involved in, we had what I used, what I call a near death experience. You know, you, you get to the point where just everything is going wrong. You run out of money. You don't have uh, customer support, whatever, Every, everything is going against you. And it's so easy to just give up. But if you just hang in there, you believe in yourself and you believe in what you're doing and, and you just keep pushing, eventually you find a way to overcome it. And, you know, I can remember even in that first startup that I talked about, we had this moment where for, for a couple of months, we weren't even paying salaries. I mean, we had no money in the bank. Everything looks, looked bad. And then somehow we managed to get someone to give us some funding and we ran forward and you know, a few years later, we were already selling more than $100 million per year and the company was a big success and we had a big exit and everything. And just don't give up. No, well, that's so amazing. And thank you so much, Kobe, for coming on today, talking to us about your background, your insights on the semiconductor industry, and sharing with us that really great piece of advice. Well, thank you for having me here. And thank you everyone for watching and listening and hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. Bye.